Have you ever wondered how the economic system of the antebellum period in America relied on the dehumanization of individuals, particularly women who endured unimaginable punishments? This dark chapter in history, marked by the disturbing practice of slavery, reveals a truth that is often overlooked, the exploitation and punishment of women within the institution of slavery. As the 19th century progressed, the transatlantic slave trade encountered mounting opposition, making it harder for colonial powers to acquire slaves. Consequently, a sinister solution emerged, breeding farms. In this video, we explore the unsettling history of these farms during the antebellum period, shedding light not only on the chilling methods employed to sustain the slave labor force, but also on the unimaginable punishments inflicted upon enslaved women. Brace yourself for an eye-opening journey into a haunting era where women's bodies became battlegrounds of cruelty and oppression, an inhumane internal market. During the 18th century, laws in America gradually stripped enslaved people of their human rights, treating them as mere objects rather than individuals. Slave owners held all the power, while those in bondage had no say or control over their lives. This belief became deeply rooted in society, and the buying and selling of slaves became an accepted norm without much resistance from the American population. Although the prohibition of importing slaves into the United States might seem like a positive step, it did little to challenge the institution of slavery itself. Influential figures of that time, like President Thomas Jefferson, who owned slaves himself and had children with a woman he enslaved named Sally Hemings, understood how vital slavery was to the southern state's economy. Surprisingly, the restriction on importing slaves didn't bring an end to the practice. Instead, it actually increased the value of slaves already within the country, turning them into highly profitable commodities. Under Jefferson's leadership, Virginia eventually became the leading state in slave production, surpassing even the profits from tobacco through the sale of enslaved individuals. The winds of change. By the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, the transatlantic slave trade was coming to an end. In Britain, a man named William Wilberforce led a movement with the help of Quakers and evangelicals. They formed the Committee for the Abolition of Slave Trade and worked towards ending the slave trade. Their efforts were successful when the British Parliament passed the Slavery Trade Act in 1807. This was a big deal and it fueled the movement to abolish slavery in America as well. However, even though the slave trade was ending, the economic importance of slave labor and the crops it produced continued to grow in America. In places like the Deep South and the western parts of the country, crops like sugarcane, cotton, and rice were being produced and making a lot of money. This became really important politically and gave confidence to the states that wanted to secede from the Union. They believed that because they had a lot of cotton, which was often called King Cotton, there would be no way the northern states would go to war with them. Interestingly, while slavery was making a lot of money for America during this time, there were also calls for its abolition. Congress and President Thomas Jefferson supported these calls. In 1808, the importation of slaves to America was banned. This happened at the same time as the invention of the cotton gin, which made it even more necessary to have a lot of labor for cotton production. Exploiting Lives for Profit The Prohibition Act of 1808 protected the internal slave market, allowing slave owners to capitalize on the breeding and sale of slaves. They referred to breeding as natural increase, despite the deliberate management and efforts involved. Black women enslaved in America became instrumental in this system, receiving rare provisions for health care. The enslaved woman's womb became a commodity, and safeguarding her fertility became crucial for those involved in the slave trade. Home medical journals circulated among slaves to aid them during difficult childbirths, a matter that would have been disregarded previously. Enslaved black women were expected to bear four to five children, highlighting the high mortality rate among slaves, which was integral to the breeding process. Female slaves were often advertised for sale based on their breeding potential, and many found themselves continuously bartered and incentivized by their owners. Shockingly, enslaved women could be offered freedom in exchange for bearing 15 children. Even children as young as 12 or 13 could be forced into pregnancy and childbirth, only to have their offspring taken away and forced into a lifetime of slavery. This system dehumanized people and treated them as mere products, children at all costs. Women slaves were burdened with childbearing from an early age, sometimes as young as 13. By the time they reached 20, they would be expected to have endured multiple pregnancies, often four to five. Enslaved women faced numerous vulnerabilities within a breeding system that demanded their reproduction. 
The slave market in 19th century America even sold pregnant women, perpetuating a cycle of rape, pregnancy, and neglected postpartum care that lasted only a few weeks before the next pregnancy was expected to commence. Masters and slave owners, as documented in various accounts, fathered children with their slaves, exploiting their lack of legal rights and personhood. The forced extraction of children from women can only be described as rape. Breeding farms intensified the inequality between white owners, protected by illegal measures, and their black counterparts, who had no recourse. House slaves faced the highest risk of victimization by their masters, leading many enslaved women to shield their offspring from their masters' wives to hide their fathers' identities. The horrors of this system underscored the dehumanizing nature of slavery, the grim science. Arranged marriages and forced mating were integral to the breeding culture during slavery. Enslaved individuals were treated like chattel and subjected to conditions reminiscent of animals. Testimonies from enslaved people mention the presence of stockmen, male slaves brought to farms to impregnate female slaves owned by the same masters. The importation of these bucks was a recurring theme in the breeding process. Slave owners aimed to produce as many slaves as possible who could endure harsh physical labor on the fields. A notable study by economist Richard Stuckey examined Virginia farms in 1860, revealing a staggering female-to-male slave ratio of around 2 to 1. This disparity meant that there were hundreds of thousands more females than males, solely to sustain the lucrative domestic breeding industry. The deeply ingrained racist ideology of American slavery justified the owner's imposition of their will upon their slaves. Alongside the systemic rape occurring on breeding farms, slave owners believed their actions were morally superior to those of the black slaves they exploited. House slaves faced the highest risk of victimization by their masters, causing many childbearing slaves to protect their offspring from their master's wives to hide their father's identities. Capitalizing on evil, the entire enterprise of breeding and abuse within the slave trade served one purpose, to reinforce and enhance profit margins. Accounts from individuals involved in the slave trade highlighted the profitability of breeding farms. One Virginia slave trader proudly declared that enforced breeding policies had provided him with 6,000 slave children to sell in a year. Thomas Jefferson allegedly boasted that the birth of black children in Virginia raised the state's capital by 4% annually. Once people were considered property, the profits derived from this industry expanded rapidly. By the mid-1800, the southern slave trade was estimated to be worth around $4 billion, surpassing income from gold, silver, currency, and even southern farmland. Slave owners had managed to make slaves more valuable than they could have ever imagined. Shockingly, the prohibition of the transatlantic slave trade inadvertently led to the development of a financial system where enslaved individuals were mortgaged as properties to banks. Southern states like Louisiana and Mississippi established banks that accepted slaves as collateral for loans. These mortgages were bundled into bonds that could be sold globally, allowing individuals from countries where slavery had been outlawed to profit from bonds backed by the value of enslaved people. In a bitter irony, the prohibition of the slave trade unintentionally facilitated the expansion of financial routes that permeated an allegedly enlightened world.